Hello and welcome to the podcast. I have, I'm trying to think of an adjective, Sarah, to describe you. The awesome, the amazing Sarah Farmer. That'll do. Um, <laughs> I'm not setting her up at all here. Um, Sarah, do you want to just say a little bit about what you do and, and then we'll kind of dig into and probe and all that kind of stuff? Okay. Hello. Yeah, my, I'm an executive coach. And I specialize in mindset and skill set development and specifically work with senior leaders and C-suite executives and their teams and some very successful entrepreneurs and business owners as well. Cool. So executive coaching, there's been a massive boom in the whole coaching world. Mm -hmm. um, some good, some bad. Uh, I think it's good that people can accept that like they need to work on things and they need somebody to draw out the blind spots really what what about if somebody's listening to this and going there's a million executive coaches mm -hmm. what's the real goal of executive coaching what what's the real benefit of it um it's a good question and actually before i answer that you just said um people think they need it um and actually it's not i mean yes they do of course there's a need but people have a misconception that coaching is about if you're doing something wrong, you need to bring a coach in to put it right, which makes them feel like they've been naughty. That's why a lot of people don't want it. They feel like it's a bad thing. And actually, when it works, it's people see I'm doing this stuff really well, but I want to do other stuff really better as well. And that's the purpose of executive coaching is help people who are um, driven and want to achieve more to get to where they want to be faster. Because... Okay. We all know that without holding a mirror up, someone holding a mirror up going, oh, you're doing this, you're saying this, have you heard that? We wouldn't hear it ourselves because we're running on unconscious thoughts and beliefs most of the time. Yeah, I suppose in my marketing world, I talk about it like sometimes we're marketing based off of what our experience has been. And that experience tells us this, but actually the world's over here. Mm -hmm. And you're, it's, I suppose coaching is very similar, isn't it? That you have this kind of, this is what you see. And a coach's job is to say, do you realize that that bit there? Is going on. Yeah. It's, somebody said to me once, I'm not sure if this is going to be the right word, but your, 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 your map is not the territory or the other way around, your whichever it is. But, but what we see the world as, what we believe to be true, is just our own little map of the world. And it's all this stuff going on the outside. But what I listen for... Um, is I look for what people are saying and what they're not saying and the words that they use. And when you're trying to find a coach that works for you, the, the most important thing is it has to be a good chemistry. But I would look for people that are able to, or they can coach properly. You know, they're listening. Maybe they've been NLP trained. They're looking for, that's neuro-linguistic programming. They're looking for what's not being said because if you're just there for a nice chat, that isn't really coaching. It's nice. It's helpful. In fact, talking to a lamppost makes you feel better, apparently. <laughs> but but to actually get the, the you know, the 40 to 50 percent improvement in productivity that we look for as, as good coaches, uh, the real life changing stuff, you've got to know what you're doing and you've got to be able to see what's going on around that person and where their tunnel vision is and open up their eyes a little bit. And just before we go any further, for anybody watching or listening, there's no script on my podcast. So Sarah has no idea what I'm going to say next. But just to play devil's advocate, there's a lot of um, airy-fairy stuff out there right now in terms of, you know, like think it and it'll happen kind of stuff. Um, how do you... How do you quantify, how would you quantify the, the whole coaching process in the sense of there's some people saying, you know, if you just meditate and look in the mirror and say things to you in the mirror, that'll, that'll change things. Uh, but how do, you, how do you help people to make sure that they're not just going for a whim, but they're actually seeing something transformation how do you make sure your, your coaching's tangible in other words it's, yeah it, it and this is one of the challenges with any sort of training and development things how do you make it tangible and um, the way I do it is for a start I don't do any airy fairy I don't have a problem with people doing airy fairy people love crystals or uh, meditation you do what's right for you but I'm actually um, I'm an I'm a, a science nerd 
you know, I've got a degree in applied chemistry, I've come through a science background, and I everything I do is based on neuroscience. So for a start, I base it on fact, not fiction. I don't base it on nice things, I base it on, on something solid. So the work I do is, you look at where are you now, where do you want to be, what's causing that gap in the middle, and then for it to be a success, the coaching you know, relationship, we look at what does success look like? What would you be doing differently? What would you be saying? What would you be feeling? Where would you be? How much will you be earning if that's the thing that you're working on? So we look at very tangible results. Um, and the reason that I do that is that not just because I want to to prove, but when someone's looking back at what they've paid for, and for a good coach, it's, it's, you know, it's a significant investment in time, money and energy. They want to look back and go, I can see that was worth every second I spent, every penny I spent on that. That's always my, you know, my key mm -hmm. aim for them is that they don't regret a second of it. Uh, and I would agree. I, I did some coaching, I want to say, two years ago, and I keep meaning to go and get some more stuff done. One of the things that I had a struggle with is, okay, you're going to coach me, but how does this, that, that exact question I just asked you, I struggled with. Mm. And I couldn't, I couldn't honestly, like, I had my reservations. And then when I went through the process, it was an eight week, I think it was eight, eight weeks I went through it. it, was, it on reflection, it was brilliant. Is this I, you were being coached? Yeah, I did it. Yeah. And, um, but on reflection, it was brilliant. But the thought of engaging it, I was like, I'm not sure I even need this. Mm -hmm. But I went down the road and thought, well, I'll do it. And what I discovered was that there was lots of little thought patterns that I had that I didn't even see, but influenced every little decision I made. And so there was, there was just, I don't want to get into like, limiting beliefs because i think as soon as sometimes we say those words and people go oh yeah yeah but i just it wasn't a li it was a limiting belief but it was just a thought process of oh no no i should do that or oh no it should be like this and i went through this it felt at the time really uncomfortable but i went through this process where somebody kept asking me why <laughs> why 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 and what i found was after going through that process, there was a whole load of things that when it boiled down to it was stupid things that I know were unrealistic and or but I'd adopted them and they were weighing so massively on my decisions. Yeah. And it's only afterwards I realized, wow. But going in, I was like mm. Do you know what I mean? It's really hard. People, I have some people who will sit with me and I do a sort of a coaching discovery session to start with to, before we work together to see. And, and people will go, right, I get it. But tell me again, how does it work? So what, what actually happens? And it's really difficult to, unless you've been through it and had that experience, mm -hmm. it's very difficult for people to, to understand it, which is part of the reason I do this sort of upfront session where we just chat so they can get an experience of what it's like. Um, but until you're actually in it, you have no idea how powerful it can be if you're with the right person doing the right work at the right time with the right intent. You know, that's the caveat because you can get the wrong people doing the wrong thing at the wrong time with the wrong intent. Um, I, I have this. I, I met a business owner and this is this is very, very successful, really successful. And um, he had more than 40 million in the bank, right? More than 40 million nice. in the bank. I met him in, um, I'm not what they called now. They're not the uh, harvester. Is it harvester? <laughs> yeah. Probably. I mean, I don't eat in those places, but <laughs> 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 not anymore. Anyway, I did when I was younger, but now I'm way down. I, I, I met him in a harvester <laughs> at lunch, right? Uh, and it was a t Tuesday because it was two meals for 20 quid on a Tuesday. Nice. Right. And I was like, why are we here? Uh, and it was fascinating. This person who was so successful, like everything was there. Like you can have your dream. Like, you can kick back now. Mm -hmm. And still involved in working, still doing all this stuff. Um, it was about 50 something. And I was like, 
there's something feels wrong about this. Why, 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 why? And I, I wasn't turning into a coach, I promise. But <laughs> in the conversation, I picked up this vibe that he had the sense that if he stopped working, he'd lose everything. Right. And it was like, why is that? And and he told me about like his early years of building his business and how it was a fight and a struggle and all yeah. these adversity. Yeah. And it was almost like he'd never shifted from that mentality, even though now he could literally do nothing for the rest of his life. He had enough money. Mm. He was flogging himself as if he had no money. It's an interesting mindset to have, isn't it? When, you, when you've got that. A lot of it is about... Um, it's an armor that we put on. And I see this a lot with, with um, leaders that have been made redundant. They've been amazing senior leaders, CEOs, CFOs, whatever. And then suddenly they're made redundant. And it's like they've become naked. You know, their armor, their, that work armor has gone. And it may be that that person you're describing just couldn't f imagine what he, he would be without this mm -hmm. identity. Because we often think we are work. But actually, we're not. We're we're human and we're work. But the whole thing is together. Um, but maybe there was a bit of that, um, you know, self-limiting belief, imposter syndrome stuff going on. I don't know. I mean, it's something that I I work with a lot of people on. And the more successful people get, the more scared they are of losing stuff. Mm. Um, and yet he had no reason to be scared because even if he did stop, nothing bad was going to happen. <laughs> exactly. It was like. I mean, you may just enjoy working. Do you know, we, we often have this, this conversation in our house, if we won the lottery, first of all, we'd have to play it. But if we won the lottery, mm -hmm. uh, what would we do? And, and I'd, I couldn't, I wouldn't stop. I'd invest more into the business, but I wouldn't stop because I love what I do. But when I got 40 million, I might slow down a bit. <laughs> Just a bit. You raised a good, po a good point there. I mean, I don't want to be all doom and gloom. And I feel like I've talked about this quite a bit recently. We've mm. got this whole recession downturn coming. Mm -hmm. uh, weird fact, by the way, which is quite funny, is most of, most of the team here at Maverick have never been an adult in a recession. So they don't even know what it's like. So that's Lucky them. <laughs> That's fascinating anyway. Yeah. But there's a lot of people who are going to go through like this, you know, companies are going to go through a kind of rationing. And I don't think they always make the right decisions when it's a recession and they get rid of good people. And suddenly we've gone from a jobs market where there's nobody, there's going to be plenty. That can take a massive hit hit on somebody's esteem getting them ready you know they've been in a place for 10 years 20 not 20 years 20, 10 years 15 years and and their identity is so much wrapped up with i've been an evp of you know this place or i've been a uh, director of this for five to six seven years mm -hmm. It's quite hard to find your feet again after something like that. It's it's an absolute blow. And actually, the uh, my book that's coming out at the beginning of next year is exactly for these people if they feel like it's been a blow. And most of them do. It's rare that they come out going, oh, it's fine. I'll get another job. I'll be, you know, in, some of them do. That's fine. Um, but after a while, especially in a, in a, a crisis that we're in now, a financial crisis where getting another job is going to be harder, it's very quickly, very easy to become scared and worried, mm -hmm. and then you start to behave differently. And actually, what happens is in a in a in any crisis, in any threat state, which is caused by the the economy, you know, landing on its knees, is we start to make some very odd decisions. We think differently. We're in a fear state of mind, so we think differently. It affects our cognitive function, our ability to communicate, collaborate, to innovate, to be brave. Just goes out of the window. People start reducing marketing spend, training spend, um, anything that actually you need to keep hold of to keep people feeling good so that they can keep you being the number one in the market or getting towards the number one in the market. It all goes. It's, it's, it's a fear response. It's a flight or fight response. And those that thrive next year learn how to manage it. And that's people who've been made redundant, people who are in business, people who are running businesses, running teams. They've got to be able to manage their emotions and their self-control first. And that's a huge amount of the work that I do before I add on any skills on top of that. Because quite frankly, if your mindset's not right, anything we do from a skills point of view, it's, it's, the ROI won't be there. 
-hmm. You know, the ROI is there when you can do what you need to do properly because this is right first. Yeah. Yeah. And and the inverse of that, some people are going to find, and this sounds horrible, but I'm I'm just going to say it the way I'm thinking about it. (laughs) Some people are going to be casualties in a recession where they lose their job. Mm-hmm. And the people who are left are going to be challenged to step up and almost absorb some of that responsibility or almost combining roles. That can be quite a, a shock for people when they go, you know, crudely, shit, I, I'm now going to step up. And it's like, I've been doing this job, I've been here for so many years, but suddenly this extra responsibility or this new division is merged with yours. And then it's like, what do I do? Double the workload. And it isn't even just, so either way, you, you do get hit. You get hit if you're being made redundant, but you also get hit if you stay because you get double the workload. And what I'm also seeing is really interesting is people are picking up, like you say, different departments, different areas. And although as a leader, you don't need to be an expert in that division or that product, whatever, it's really uncomfortable to, first of all, double your workload, but also to do it with people that are experts in different areas to you. So whether you stay or whether you go, whatever happens, everybody's mental resilience, their mental capacity is being drained. And let's remember, it's only like yesterday that COVID was a thing. Mm-hmm. And we're all mentally drained from that anyway. So I kind of see it as a, as a tank of resilience reserve. It was already bumping around on empty and now we're withdrawing again. And we're wondering yeah. why people are suffering health problems, anxiety, it's really no shock. Um, yeah. and, and for organisations that are aware of this and doing something about it, not just ticking boxes, you know, thank goodness for them because they are doing their best to look after after these people. Sorry, my think it's pinging. <laughs> <laughs> so thinking about those kind of, let's talk, talk about them as, as career shocks, yeah? Um, and as a business owner, you have those career shocks because... You know, I can remember when I started with, co- you know, the whole COVID thing. I'm like, all that control has just been taken away from me. You know, and when you're a business owner, you do, you know, you you live with an element of risk. Yeah. You're living with risk all the time. Oh, yeah. But, but suddenly, suddenly, actually, the risk was the government's telling us what to do on a day to day basis. Yeah. I can't plan. It's not in my own control anymore. I, I, in some senses, it you felt like you were on. I don't want to diminish it, but it felt like a war footing as a business because you didn't know what was coming next. Yeah. That kind of shock, whether you're an employee, you know, senior leader, you you could be a junior member of staff or a business owner. That shock. What are some of the things you'd be saying to people if you know? Let's just kind of imagine they're on that thirty minute. Um, call with you what would be some of the questions you'd be helping or saying to them to help them reflect and go am I in the right place and and how do I draw myself out of that shock state into something that's useful there's yeah there's a couple of things that I'd be doing one is to understand what's really causing the shock state because it's a fear response but people have to see that it's a fear response and they have to recognize they're doing it most of us go into it unconsciously or subconsciously so we don't even know we're really doing it so the first thing is to is to raise awareness and say you are doing this and they're like okay I get that I'm doing it why am I doing it where's it coming from but also what's it protecting you from it'll be protecting you from something because we do it on purpose to keep ourselves safe Mm -hmm. the next part is how do we actually then um, look at minimizing the risk for you and this is about focusing on what you can and can't control So we're looking at, I don't know if you've heard of the sphere of influence, but it's something that is used quite widely in in my line of work. But this is, we tend as as humans to focus on what's on the outside, the things that we cannot control. And now the dogs are barking as well. This is real real life, guys. Sorry, live, you know, work at home. Excuse the two hours. Um, But so we look at what's on the, what are you focusing on that you cannot control? Because that's usually what causes the fear. I can't control yeah. there's a pandemic. I can't control whether I can or, go to, can or not go to work. I can control how much doom and gloom I watch on the TV. We're all like this. 
give me more death stats, you know, and just keep doing. And then we wonder why we're feeling worse and worse and worse. So what can you control? What can you influence? And I get people to focus on those. There is nothing like taking positive action to take your mind off the stuff that you can have nothing to do with and can't control at all. And the reason I say this as, as simply as I do is I've had to do the same. When COVID hit, my whole business died, absolutely yeah. died. And I took three months to furlough myself, which felt weird, but I did it. And in that time, I thought, what can you do? What do you really want to be doing? Now be brave and go and do it. And I changed it all around. And that's why I'm doing what I do today. And I have to say thank you to COVID because for some people, it, it forced your hand. Mm -hmm. um, and I used it as a way to drive me forward, not hold me back. And I, I guess that is an attitude, though, isn't it? That it's a mindset hard. it's a mindset and it's it's one you can fake until you make you know you talked to right at the beginning about can you stand in the mirror and go i am great i am fabulous this is going to work actually yes you can you know there's there's um there's an amazing um psychologist called amy cuddy you can find her on youtube and she talks about power posing you've probably heard of it but actually if you know if you hold a power a power pose for two minutes like a like a peacock does when it spreads out its way its um its feathers or a lion roars and you imitate even like the Hussein Bolt you know pose things like that if you hold it for two minutes you can create chemicals in your body that make you feel more powerful that's what's what's called power mm -hmm. pose while you're feeling like that you can take better action so I'm not saying you do it every day every minute because otherwise you'd look like a lunatic but as part of a program of growth. It's a very useful thing to kickstart yourself when you're feeling, ugh. But you've got to do the deep work underneath it, first of all, which is recognising that you're doing it, why you're doing it, where it's coming from, how it's helping you, how it's hindering you. Then you look at change. Yeah. So that some of those little tricks are good to help you keep momentum. Yes, absolutely. Not, you know, if, 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 I just, if I just talk to myself and tell, me, tell the mirror I'm wonderful... <laughs> that's not going to fix the underlying issue. No. It, it just gives you a little kind of burst of positivity that can be hit, nudge you. It, I call it a Band-Aid. It's, it's a bit of a Band-Aid on a gaping wound. Now, not everybody has a gaping wound, so the Band-Aid is fine on a small cut. You know, you look at someone like the fabulous Mel Robbins who has her five-second rule. You know, if you can't do something, count back from five. Five, four, three, two, one, boom, you go. Brilliant. Those, don't, those people do not have a ser serious problem. And it's mm. great for simple little things like, I don't want to get out of bed. Come on. Five, four, three, two, one, get out of bed. This isn't the same as taking control of imposter syndrome or real self-limiting beliefs or, you know, a lack of self-value. That ain't going to mm. cut it. But it's a nice thing to have once you've started to deal with the real problem. And I guess that value piece, like, if you're stepping up, right, so... So let's let's just look at it like recession, right? So yeah. you're a business owner. Well, there's this, this kind of three camps I'm seeing here, right? Your business owner going into recession, even for me, you know, COVID was kind of insulated recession. Really, it didn't <clears throat> it didn't feel like a recession because there was so much support to kind of insulate us from the pain of it. But um, if you discount that, the last recession I had was 2008 which seems a million miles away yeah i can't remember what that was like properly but it was difficult but it's like over there somewhere yeah so me as business owner going into a recession i'm like oh what's this gonna bring you know there's that sense of uh, am i capable to see the business through that what decisions will i make the right decision what yeah. if i make the wrong decision yeah you've got evp or, you know, senior leader in a business who's just took over responsibility going, I've now got a whole load of responsibility in a difficult time for the business. That whole value piece sat there going, oh, can I do this? Am I up to this? Um... And, and then... worse, people think they're the only ones thinking that. They think I'm alone thinking that. And actually, when we come out and go, I'm thinking like that too, everyone goes, oh, thank goodness. I thought it was because I was rubbish. No, it's not. It's because you're a human being. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the people who've lost their job who take the whammy of, oh, so they just, so I was expendable. That's a hit. Massive. But then the natural thing is, you know, there's going to be more people going for the same job now, you know, 
two years, where are we, a year ago, it was like, actually, that there was one person applying for a job. You've got it. Now you're going to have this scenario where you might actually get rejected. So it kind of reinforces the fact that uh, I, I was expendable and now I've been rejected. And now I've got to prove myself to somebody else when I've just had two knockbacks. And that's the mindset problem is if you think like that, it's going to leak. I talk about emotional leakage a lot. It's going to leak out in every application you do, every interview you go into, every conversation you have. We cannot help but leak this information. You and I, we all have mirror neurons in our head, these things that pick up information. And if you, if I'm uncomfortable, you will pick it up as an interviewer. You might not know why, but what it does is it raises a level of discomfort in you that makes you think, I'll just tell that person they weren't a good fit because I have no idea why I don't like them. But the fact that my trust and my fear response has, you know, trust has gone down, fear has gone up. I don't want them in my business, even mm. though they could be the best person. So part of my other life in what I do is, is helping people. And I started this during COVID is helping people manage the mindset before they even go into an interview and get rid of the I was expendable to I was a casualty of circumstance. But here's all the evidence to say that I am worthy yeah. and I am valuable and I am awesome and you need me in your organisation. And when people have that mindset, they are oozing, instead of leaking negativity, negativity they're oozing competence, mm -hmm. the right level of confidence, not over, because that's icky, mm -hmm. and people warm to them. And that's when you get, a, you know, people go, actually, I've now got four job offers. How did that happen? Mm -hmm. Well because we switched the mindset around. You know, this, you said something really interesting there, and, and this is really hard. I've, I've interviewed a lot of people over the last two years, and we've grown our team here, but one of the things that I've always struggled with is detecting the difference between humility and a lack of confidence in an interview. I really struggle to detect which is which. I can tell you what overconfidence looks like. Yeah. I can tell you what somebody who looks like a good bet looks like, but when you find, meet somebody who's really um, kind of just down to earth and straightforward, but humble or lack of confidence, I can't tell the difference. And, and one of my best members <coughs> of staff I hired, she she asked me at the end of the interview, do you have any concerns about me as a candidate? And I thought, oh, I'm going to be honest. Normally I would go, oh, I don't like yeah. answer. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, my only concern is you come across as being quite nervous and quite not very confident. And I would worry if you have to do certain types of work, whether you'd be able to carry that out. And I was honest and I thought, I don't know whether I should have said that or not. She's turned out to be one of the star players. Mm -hmm. But in her interview, she, was, she wasn't very confident and it undermined her interview with me. And it could have gone either way. And I, I guess that, I, I don't know what I'm even saying here. But well, it's, it, you're, you're, it's interesting because your perception, what I hear from that is your perception was she wasn't as confident as you've liked her to be. There could be reasons for that. It could have been in how she was communicating with you. It could have been the fact it was just an interview. And as an interviewer, it's really important to put that person at ease because mm. they are you're you know you are potentially in a in a high pressure situation. They want to show that they're right. You but also you want to show that you're right for them as well. But so she she left you with a perception of not so much confidence. But what she did at the end proves something very different to you. Mm -hmm. An unconfident person would not say, what do you think? They would have just gone, thank you very much, goodbye. Mm -hmm. And actually it was that that turned it around, I would think. That's because it gave you an opportunity. But you also, you liked her. Mm -hmm. If you had disliked her and felt her unconfidence, you'd have just said, no, you're fine. And then, oh, you weren't the right cultural fit. I don't know what it was, but there was just something. Um, so... I know there wasn't really a question in there, but it was just it was just an interesting observation for me to hear as someone who helps people in interviews how to get things back on track mm -hmm. if you can. But yeah, it's a high it, pressure situation for both parties, isn't it? Yeah, but for me it was really interesting to see how how difficult it was for me to decide to differentiate 
like somebody being just nervous and and humble. That was it. Yeah. How do you and, see the and, difference? And somebody, you know, I don't think they can cut it. The, so the line between those two is really difficult. It to is. Judge. It is. It's murky. And actually, in the book, I have created. Oh, well, now it's going into the book. Is there something called the imposter meter? Um, and in those descriptions, you so we've got this utopic state in the middle, which is not no, but it's low levels of imposter syndrome. It's just a moderate level of self-limiting belief that makes us um, humility is there, but not over humble. On this side, you've got extreme overconfidence and mild overconfidence. We recognise that straight away. To the other side of this utopic state is humble plus. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit too, it's consistently humble, putting yourself down, self-deprecating, say, oh, you know, oh, I'm not sure. And you pick it up. And then you've got the next extreme, which is almost crippled by imposter syndrome where you don't even speak up. You wouldn't even go to an interview. So what mm-hmm. you're seeing is that sort of humble plus into utopic state. And I think we just need to accept in an interview, people might become a little bit more nervous because of the pressure there and they want the job and they want to do a good job to allow them to dip into that a bit, but to recognise it as what it is and mm-hmm. um, do our best to cause comfort so they can relax. But look for consistently putting yourself down. Um, look for not being able to say this is what I did, how I did it, and and speak with confidence. And if you're picking it up, there's a lack of confidence. There is. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. There just is. That's your perception. That's what they're leaking to you. And maybe ask them. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm picking up. You're a bit uncomfortable right now. Is there anything I can do to make you feel more comfortable or what's going on for you? It's interesting you say that about the I and we that's come up a couple of times um this week for me um i've been talking to a couple of people about and i actually spoke to an executive on wednesday in a company and he was saying we've been advocated and this is where it comes into my world we've been advocated by senior management to get out there on social media and build the personal brand for the business but yeah I don't, he said, how do I communicate out there using I and what I'm doing in the business without undermining the team effort? And I don't know whether that's a sign, just a genuine conversation or a sign of this I versus we. If you're saying we a lot in an interview or it can be good to say, oh, no, I'm part of a team. But actually, it's also you can hide behind we as well. You can. Um, so the, the it's, a, it's again, really good question. How did it, the I is what did I do to facilitate this thing that I'm talking about? But the ability to say I didn't do it on my own is humility. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the humble or the over humble, humble plus stuff is, oh, we did this, we did that, we did the other. Now, What's really interesting here is that people with, um, we're now looking at behavioural styles. You know, if you've got a strong analytical preference or an amiable preference, that might not mean anything to people out there. But there are four main archetypes of behaviours that, that we that we have. I'm a massive expressive. Hi, you know, look at me. Um, you're more of a, an introverted analytical preference. We can just tell that by the way you speak, the way, you know, you hold your body. But people are, who are more analytical and amiable will talk about we more than I because mm-hmm. that's, they want to be part of the team and they don't want to look like they're showing off. Whereas the expressive and the drivers might be like, oh, I did this, I did that, and have to remember that actually it wasn't I, it was actually us and we. Mm-hmm. So we've also got behavioral styles and preferences in here that will drive how we're communicating what we're trying to um, to get across to the interviewer, the potential employer. So part of the work that I also do is not just the mindset, but how are you going to communicate that in a way that other people can hear? You know, if I was being interviewed by you and came in going, oh, hi, Dean, you know, I'm massive expressive. That's all I'm giving off. And you're thinking, right, back off, Tiger. You know, immediately there's a dislike. It wouldn't matter what I said. You've already decided I am not the person that you want in your team because I am too full on. And I should mm-hmm. be able to tone that down and dial it down appropriately to speak to the person in front of me so that I can build liking, build trust. And then I should be calmer. You should be calmer. I should be able to think about I versus we. It all just then comes together. Do you think there's 
just on that, with the dynamic of, say, an interview or a, or a big meeting, for an example, uh, and this might be straying out of your area, I'm not sure, that whole mirroring piece, um, it's very important in sales conversations, but, but who should be the mirror? <laughs> the grown-up who knows about it. That's, I, whenever I'm training this, people go, well, why should I have to do it? I'm like, yeah, right, first of all, you're learning how to do it. So be the grown up and use it. Why wouldn't you want to use it? That's the question. Mm -hmm. um, most people feel annoyed uh, or they're actually they're just uncomfortable doing it because it feels, why should I change? Now, the, the thing about this is such a big topic and it is communication styles, versatility, massive part of everything that I do because it underpins everybody's success. Um, but if you're in a meeting and there is high tension or high pressure, you become versatile because it lowers tension. Mm -hmm. If you're just having a chat with people you've known for ages, you don't need to be versatile as much. The only time we need to be versatile is when we're in a stressful situation, something new is happening or it's a new relationship. That's when you need to put on your best clothes and your best outfit and your best face and everything because you're trying to build liking. It's not that you're creating an unrealistic idea of who you are. You're just putting on your best self. And one of the biggest misconceptions is this mirroring is I become someone else. Mm -hmm. If I'm mirroring someone who is quieter than me, more analytical and slower of speech, I'm still me, but I'm just changing the tone of my voice. That's it. And all of a sudden, I no longer offend that person in front of me because I've toned it down. People think I've got to change and be changed forever. Well, you can't because it's exhausting. It's not authentic. It's, it's stupid. Use it wisely. Use it sensibly. Use it when you need to. And use it appropriately by dialing up, dialing down little behaviours to help the situation move faster, be better, be more productive. That's the intent yeah. always. So... The whole mirroring piece works well wherever you are, really, whether mm -hmm. you're if you're trying to bond with somebody. Um, but I'm just going to throw a spanner in again. <laughs> in a, in a, an environment where you've got a lot going on in your head, you know, I, I, you know, there might be things like I, this needs to go well. I want to give the right impression. So you've got all of these things ru running around. How do you control yourself? To be able to go, right, okay, I should be mirroring here and I, not just drifting off into bouncy you or how do you like it's a organize that? It's a conscious decision. So you, um, I've been doing this for years. I, I got trained to do this uh, in one of my first sales jobs, which is n uh, nearly 30 years ago. All right. And I have been trained and retrained and trained and retrained. Then I become a trainer of it. I do it every day. It is a conscious uh, choice that my intent in any relationship is for it to be comfortable. So automatically now, because of the amount of times I do it, and I do get it wrong still, often, you know, that's, hu that's just being human, is I automatically think, who have I got in front of me? How are they presenting? What do I need to do to make them feel more comfortable? That's it. And okay. that's all I do. The, the, um, you have got a lot going on in your head when you're going into an interview or a tricky situation, self-management learning how to think things through and plan for that meeting and plan to manage your own self-control is key and that's what i mm. teach people to do how do you do that first of all you have to know how you're coming across in the first place if i didn't know i was a loony expressive or you know when i've got my guards down i would never know to tone that down with someone that wasn't you've got to learn mm. one thing i just want to say about mirroring um there's a lovely video which i'll share with you offline um of what happens when you have built a strong connection, you've really related with someone, is that without knowing, you start to mirror. So if someone's, you're chatting to someone, you're getting really well and they do this, you can see the other person start to do that as well. They start to mirror you. That is a sign that they are bonded with you and feeling really relaxed. So I'm not gonna start copying you doing this now. But what people think is that they do it on purpose to make someone like them. Don't do that. Because that just looks weird. So if you move forward, then I do this and I start copying you. I'll think, why is she copying my every move? But it, it happens automatically. And sometimes you catch it happening. You think, oh, it just happened.
happened and you realize you're in deep rapport with someone it's incredible um so so that kind of it's like the oh i pick my coffee cup up and you pick your coffee cup if it happens naturally that's quite normal but if you start to do it too weird it's no it's you don't want to i mean some people will say well you know mirror a bit of stuff so if someone is sat leaning forward you might automatically sit up a bit straighter because you want yeah. to match some of that. But I, you, you probably do that automatically. Um, but what you're looking for is wh- what's my baseline? How do I behave and what do I do? Normally I'm kind of in the screen and forward and all of this. But if someone comes in and they're sat right back and they've got their arms folded, I would probably just immediately move back a little bit. I, but I do that without thinking now because it's part of my ingrained behaviour. But when I get it wrong... Oh my God, can I tell? And we know when we've got it wrong. Mm. Just, just a quick story. I was, I was being interviewed by four senior leaders in, a, in a, an organisation I was going to do some work with. The first three, I was seeing them all back to back, big mistake. First three, all expressives like me. We had a lovely time. We chatted. It was brilliant. Went into the last one at five o'clock till 5.30. This guy sat in the canteen area and I banded in. I was like, hi, <gasps> should we have a cup of tea? And he looked at me and just went, no, we'll just have a chat and we'll get on with it. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I, I couldn't have made, I, and I never backtracked. I mean, I still got the gig, but it was, I, he never liked me. Mm. And it was that simple because I'd lost my emotional self-control. I'd been on expressive, um, waggy tail, Labrador puppy-esque mode for the last three half hours. I didn't mm. take a second to go think calm see what's in front of you deal with that first mm. it's a good learn though. I, I had i had a story uh somewhat similar of somebody do that to me uh, and it was surprising that um they approached me on linkedin it was actually a coach yeah, yeah? and and their approach to me was very good. And I was kind of impressed because obviously that's my thing, sales outreach and stuff. It was like, I'm really impressed with the way you do it. So I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll I'll, uh, I'll have a call with you. And there was a few pleasantries and they told me a bit about their background and everything. And, and they, they'd they been involved in some big uh, businesses. So I was mm-hmm. like, oh, okay. And then um, it's kind of started to turn into a coaching session and they they adopted a style with me which was a little bit like um i'm the expert and i'm going to ask you questions and one question they asked me and it, i think it was the way they asked me they said well why have you not done that yet right and the style of the way they did it and i went mm. So knackered. you see Dean like this now chatting, and then Dean goes like this. Well, she's went, saying to you, what what you're hearing there is, you're, I was going to swear then, you're an idiot. Why haven't you done that yet? And actually, you said earlier in this conversation about the why. Actually, coaches ideally wouldn't be using the word why. Mm. What you're doing when you're coaching is... Tell me how you've come to that conclusion. How did you decide not to do that or do that? It's a very different conversation to, why didn't you do that, idiot? Because yeah. that's how it feels, isn't it? Yeah. And it's like and a I sales process. You can, went, yeah, shut down. Shut down completely. And I said, well, it's been really nice chatting. <laughs> <laughs> Bye-bye. <Yeah. laughs> because it's like, hang on a minute. You're going to take me on a journey. You have to take me on a journey. And they were like, no, no. I'm going to grab you by the neck and try and pull you on this journey. It's like, I'm not going. Someone said to me yesterday, uh, we were talking about, she was describing um, her troubles in the position she's in. And she's very high level up, but doing a lot of sales based stuff. And she said, oh, you know, I'm having to drag these clients through the process and do this. The words that we use describe exactly how we're going to feel about that person. If she feels she's dragging someone through it, if that person thought they were the expert, it's all wrong. The intent is wrong. You know, the intent for a coach is purely, first of all, do we gel? If we do, what is it you're trying to achieve? Can I help you? Can I help you? Can I show you stuff holding up the mirror? Can I ask you questions? People don't know how to discover well enough. 
They mm-hmm. just go in with crap questions, that, like old sales techniques. Why are you doing that? You want this instead. You shouldn't be doing that. Of course, it's going to rub people up the wrong way. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, that's someone who hasn't invested in learning how to understand someone else's situation well enough without yeah. their back up. I was surprised how quickly I went from like really relaxed and chatty to like, you can feel it in an instant. And it doesn't matter how long you've been talking and how much you like that person. In that second, you decided that was it. And there's, it, you cannot get that trust back. Mm-hmm. You can't. It's gone. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, it, if you make that mistake in a meeting or an interview, it can be not just like job, uh, you know, you don't get the job. If you were in a role, a senior role, it can it can leave you it can end your career or it can leave you stuck in a job where you could have had progression yeah it causes all sorts of problems once you're in a job um and you've got some uh, collateral with people you, you've built up a bit of an emotional bank account you can make mistakes mm-hmm. but you can't afford to do that in the very early stages so when you're interviewing when you're onboarding you know I talk about um the importance of getting the onboarding piece right this isn't just what you do in your first 90 days from a task point of view but how do you build allies how do you build relationships how do you build people that are going to support you and you can support them because if you're not making you don't have to like each other but if you're not building trust you're on a real fast exit out the door very soon afterwards because Mm -hmm. it's all about building trust first But once you've got that collateral, once you've built those relationships, you can make errors. You can come back from errors. Um, But also there's a whole process of how do you do that? First of all, you've got to know you've made one. Then you've got to apologize for it. And then you've got to say, this is why I'm going to prevent this happening again. And for some leaders who aren't humble enough, they're like, I don't need to do that. I'm the leader. And guess what? They're the ones that sometimes end up staying in a job because people are too scared to get rid of them. And they're like, "Ah." You don't want to get rid of them, get rid of the other ones. <laughs> yeah. So, Sarah, what? Do, how do people? How do people work with you? How would somebody engage with you? And what do you do? What What does your program or the way you work with people look like? So, there's, there's a few ways to work with me. I work one to one, and actually, I have literally one space left for next year. I've been. I'm about to be too humble then, and so I've been really lucky. I haven't. Uh, I, I'm good. Okay, so that's that's why I've got one space less for next year, and. Um, so that's if you want to work with me one to one, we need to talk now and I need to put you on a waiting list, probably. Uh, and that's OK. But I work with the people for a minimum of six months, one to one. It usually goes to 12 months and often beyond that. Or people stop at 12 and then come back six months later. Um, the group stuff is, is easier to get involved in. And the, the main one I'm working on at the moment is the Eagle Development Programme, which is all about developing mental resilience, um, confidence, taking control of imposter syndrome, um, and that course is starting on the 11th of January. There's already people booked in on that, but there are spaces. Um, but if people want to find out what I do and how to work with me, go to my website. Um, I don't know if we can put the details on here. Find yeah, me on LinkedIn, DM me, do something and just say, I'd just like to talk to you for half an hour. Um, those half an hour coaching discovery sessions are a two way street. We find out about each other but they are at the moment just for senior leaders and executives because I don't have the space or time, sadly, to to work with first line leaders and individual contributors. Um, But that's something that I'm looking to grow the team to do over time so that they can also get all the goodies that are out there for these, um, for the, for the senior leaders too. And people can kind of jump in. You've done a webinar in the last couple of weeks that's on YouTube. They can have a look at that. Well remembered. So I've got, yes, the webinar. Oh yeah. And funny enough, I've got one coming up on Wednesday. I'm glad you reminded me. <laughs> I will show up. So there's yeah, there's a webinar coming up on um, on Wednesday. That's three till four. Um, and if you want to get involved in that, I haven't seen anything about it, just DM me. We'll get you the information. But you need to book in. It's a closed group, so you need to book in to do that. And that is all on how do you take control of negative self-talk, which quite frankly, I don't know many people that aren't having a little bit of negative chatter going on at the moment because the world's just a little crazy. Media media doesn't help. They love a good uh, nightmare story. Don't they? Well, I don't. That's why I don't read them. I don't read anything. I'm terrible. I just read articles now rather than the me- watch the news or media because it just brings me down. Um, but that's my emotional self-control. My control mechanism is there. 
So if you want to hear more about how to, to take control of the mindset and you know stop that negative chatter, join me. It'll be an enlightening, fun session. I will be expressive <laughs> and lively. <laughs> are you just being are you just being subdued because of me i'm, I'm being quite well contained aren't i <laughs> sarah what i'm going to do is i'm going to put uh this up i'll put the links to your profile i'll also um i'll get people the details of that webinar um so after this i'll put it out i'll put a little post out on linkedin so people can get that just in case they don't see it in this in time Sarah, you've been an absolute star. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having um, me. And I can only apologise for the pinging and the dog noises and everything else. But the joys of working from home, it's just what it is. <laughs> but thank you for I'll, having I'll, me. I'll, I'll leave you with a funny story, right, about working from home. Okay. Because this was so much fun, right? So I'm on a call with a CMO of, um, of a big company. We're talking and she's at a, like a, like a desk in a in a bedroom yeah beds all made and everything and there's like those you know those sliding mirror wardrobes yes yeah right and she she it looked like she'd shoved all the junk in the wardrobe and she'd not slided it across <laughs> and i was like and then she realized that, she realized i was looking at her junk in the wardrobe <laughs> <laughs> There's an even better one that my, I, I won't say who it was actually, but somebody I know was on a Zoom call with somebody and someone walked past naked. I think that's happened a few times. So they were in a, an office bedroom, but the door was open to the hallway and obviously someone didn't realise they were on a call and they just walked straight past in the buff. And uh, this person was just like, whoa, that was a, that was a lot I wasn't expecting to see today. <laughs> Oh, well, we didn't go that far, so we're all good. So, Sarah, <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much for joining me. Thank really you. Really appreciate it. And go find out more about what Sarah gets up to. And if you're somebody who needs Sarah's help, go go have a chat. find out more. Yeah. Drop her a line. Have a chat. She won't grill you. She won't do what that coach did to me. And, uh, Sarah, thanks again. Thank you.